Should we remove the ANC? And will things get better? The thing is, if you remove the ANC, who are you putting in? The DA, which is the official opposition? What has the DA with the power it's had in the Western Cape done for the majority of black people? The Mitchell's Plain, the Cape Flats. What has the Democratic Alliance done for those poor people there? Very good afternoon and welcome to the virtual Mkuku. Uh, as always, please don't forget to click on the subscribe button. Please don't forget to click on the notification bell. And don't forget to visit our Khrotman podcast just next door, which is the Hustlers Corner. They both drop at the same time on Mondays at midday at 12 o'clock. And as you guys know, later on, this is just a warm up so that you guys can go and watch podcast and chill with Mac G and Saul Penduga. Today, I'm going to give a bit of a disclaimer. Number one, I'm not an energy expert, which is fundamentally important. Number two, I'm not DJ Smoo, the blessing of blessings, to please lead today's congregation, because I think I have a lot of information that I would like to share with you guys. If you're new to the platform, guys, we've just hit 10,000 subscribers, and we want to thank you guys for the support. Uh, thank you so much. So now the road to 20,000 subscribers officially begins. I think the Hustlers Corner is on like 170,000 or something ridiculous. But one day, Baba, one day, Baba, so figure up. So again, welcome to the virtual Kuku, and let me hand over to Ikhrod Maniam, DJ Smoo. Mr. Penuel. Excess Buddha. I'm all right, how are you? I love the T-shirt you're wearing, love. Thank you so much. Yeah. And this was a gift from Black Society. You can't see at the back here, but uh, a gentleman that I met early 2022 was like, look, dog, uh, I like what you do. I know you're a minimalist. You like black. And he just gave me a black tee, gave me a black golfer, Black Society. I don't know if they're still pushing, but uh, I'm ripping them today. Nice one, beautiful. And also, we are wrapping at number 199 Oxford Road in Rosebank. There is a beautiful Asian fusion spot called Waku, W-A-K-U. Check them out on social media. It's waku underscore Z-A. Yeah. That's where we are today. And um, the podcast will be moving around all over the country. It'll be beautiful for us to be at um, tertiary institutions, visiting students. It's a must. It'll be beautiful for us to visit township businesses, do some episodes there, yeah. promote some businesses at Kasi, you know, um, do some episodes from um, people that sort of feel they want, um, yeah, or maybe you guys can actually invite us. It's a must. If you own a I, restaurant or you own a spot, invite us. We can host us. We can just please. probably just bring the cameras and host an episode from your establishment. So we promo you, you host us, we all meet while we educate our community online. I think it can be something beautiful. It's a must. So Uspul Siso has been saying this the whole of last year. And I think it's a challenge to anyone who's part of SRC or COSAS, I think you've mentioned, yeah. at any tertiary institution. We will try and get to you. If we can't, obviously, we'll make a plan. But please invite us to your tertiary institution, maybe even a high school, to your business. We will try and get there. We will broadcast from there. You guys can maybe join us. We can have a few chats, etc. And let's connect and build this virtual Mkuku, as we've said before, into a virtual squatter camp. We're coming from a very sad week. Um, it's not easy to recover. You know, you don't just overcome what has just happened just like that. I, it, it's pretty much shocked the entire country. Mm. It's only now that I actually understand the magnitude of what just happened over the past two weeks with the passing of um, Tibbs and um, AKA Kieran. Yeah. May their souls rest in peace once again. But then again, you know, we were just uh, coming from a week where we, we, we just buried our brothers, AKA and Tibbs. Yeah. And then just this past week, it was exactly a year since Ricky Makado, yeah. Ricky Rick, um, sadly passed on a year ago. Yeah. Little did we know last year that we'd be in um, another dark cloud again. So as a country, we have been shocked, we've been traumatized. We've had to have conversations with our kids mm. uh, about what has happened. And also we've just had um, to have conversations amongst ourselves. And we spoke about Ubuntu. Mm. We spoke about how, you know, we should handle these types of things in the future, mm. not to just spread information recklessly like that. And I also told you of an episode that I had with Nota as well, yeah. where I was saying, Mfana Simzin, I understand you were also traumatized, but maybe some of the things, how you handled them, you know, shouldn't have been um, handled the way, you know, you did. And he also did uh, mention that, you know, he put out an apology out there he was at, a, at an institution and he had an episode, but then you sort of understand the yeah. whole country was traumatized. Yeah. I mean, my daughter, 
big AKA fan also, traumatized. Yeah. So um, we, we understand. And um, let's, uh, I, I'd like to say, whatever you believe in, I think it's just that time for you to start building that relationship, you know, with your higher powers, whether I'm a Josie, getting in whoever you believe and I think um, it's about time to just strengthen your relationship you know I, I think we need to reflect uh, I know you are a believer of African spirituality and I'm just trying to think what this might mean because February in, in, in America is Black History Month is my understanding but if you look at how Ricardo went and took his life last year February you look at what's happened to Kian and, and, and Tibelo. Um, and look, they may not be necessarily black Africans, but I mean, Uri Vastian Camp was also killed in the month of February. If, if maybe we need to figure out in in Feb, that we maybe need to cleanse ourselves, uh, cleanse ourselves of as, as a people, as a country, so that we can have a healthier energy. As a bantu. So yeah. I think that's very important. I just want to say to the squatters, guys, we read all your comments. I read all your comments and thank you so much for all the comments. Thanks for to all the paying members. Thanks to everyone who donates for the super thanks. I know some of you last week in the episode that we had was speaking about the fact that you'd like to see subtitles because we, we stream around the world. We saw some of you from Namibia, from Botswana, overseas, etc. We we are working on it to get the subtitles so that when we go into Isi Zulu or another non-English language, we don't lose you guys as well. Yeah, exactly. And by the way, don't forget to also go and subscribe to the Penuel show. He drops episodes Mondays at nine o'clock in the morning. So he's just dropped a brand new one as well. So while you're on the other side on the hustler's corner, go visit Nangale next door. You know, it's in another cool and but it's back opposite. Sure. It's back opposite. Sure. It's back next door. Sure. It's back next door. Yes. So next door the Penuel show. next door the hustlers corner. No The big house. I'm cool. A big opposite. The hustlers corner. I'm cool. Yeah, It's actually interesting that talking about that. There's other cultures or in other families where or mm. where the it's long sometimes. There's other, I don't want to say races, but other cultures, even mm. in other countries, where even if no mu pumile la inji, so so kali so kuli lu yoshata. Yes. No mu shata o shata gotwa inju ozo yako no mu muzozo wako ozo waka around the same environment. Yes. No mak nasi inju le gotwa inji yako will still be in the in the same yard. Yes. Not far away from lapo kule lo yes. kona. I understand there's cultures that do that. There's definitely cultures that do that. And I'll tell you, uh, one of my big fascinations with my family, my brother Pinson and I speak about this a lot, multi-generational homes where Kokonomkulu and us and our children live in one, either it's a house or a yard. Uh, the Indians in South Africa do that very well. We need to start getting to a place where we bring back our communities. We were sold, uh, not necessarily a lie, but we were sold a capitalist trick of get as far away from home as possible to be successful. Isolate yourself away. And that's actually not African at all. What's important is uwaka lagini, even as an African. And look, Jobusho, around the world, it's the same thing. There's a main house, and then from there, you come and you build gini. And even Abandabalande, this time, they speak about uwaka umuz gababa kind of situation. So it's, it's definitely something we need to look into, something we need to invest in. Ima imagine having your mother as a babysitter, having your grandfather who can maybe fix cars, who services your car, having your brother who does something else down the road. You literally have your family and your community here, which is how it was always meant to be. I had a chat with Cabello sometime last year, a dope interview. Go check it out if you haven't had a chance to on the Hustlers Corner. And and as we were having a conversation, he challenged me online on camera. He's like, when are you getting married, bro? Boom. Like, when are you... And then our, our discussion, even off camera, escalated into Mfanagiti. The family unit is under attack yes. globally, all over yes. the world, especially Tina, as Africans. Yes. See, Abantu, exactly as you're saying, with Abantu, you know, we're a family unit. Yes. They say things like it takes a village to raise a child. Next door. And, you know, just how we grew up, just that spirit, as you're saying, has been so much under attack that even Nasenjini, mm. where you look at, at the ads and everything else that is just this agenda that is just preached all over the world, it's just. 
I think it's trying as much as it's, it can to sort of separate what in separate the family unit. 100%. And I think it's our responsibility as well as broadcasters to mm -hmm. encourage that, you know, that oneness. I think I, I had an epiphany a couple of days ago um, because I do one-on-one -on -one consultations with people online. Um, and I advise people on personal finance, on career. And I realized that most of the issues that we have, whether black, white, whatever, most of the issues, when you look at the genesis, it's because there's an unhealthiness ekaya. And I realized that I think part of the really important work, and I've started making a couple of videos on Penuel the Black Pen, where I'm like, we need to start speaking about how can we build healthier relationships ekaya. And I've been anti-marriage. I, I think I've said this on platforms. And in the last month or two, I'm trying to rewire my mind in the sense that when people are like, and I'm like, yes, but I believe in the family unit. And they're like, how? Because you need to get married. I'm like, no, you don't. And I think where I'm at now is realizing my issues are not marriage or union. My issues are signing funny contracts. My issues are spending money you don't have as a couple. My issue is following customs that are maybe outdated or that maybe we haven't been respecting from birth. Says Funuk Zot Oshanji at the top, things that we don't really understand. But in terms of the family unit and marriage, there's a, there's a big chance that I actually believe in marriage as what it's meant to be. But I don't believe in what it has been bastardized to become. But until we fix the family unit, until we stop pushing funny feminism agenda, they're saying, ah, very much here. And we say, let's come together and help each other and build, we're, we're never gonna win. Muslims, I speak about them a lot. Jewish people, I speak about them a lot. White Afrikaners, I speak about them a lot. All of the successful groups that you see, when you look at it, you realize a lot of their family units as a core are healthy. Then it's easier to work Noma Keluan and as a community because you know, so then you can come together and build. It's even easier to pass on the family's legacy yes. onto the next generation. 100%. Because and then it's even easier to professionals, people who know how to do it even better. People talk about trusts, people talk about our life policies, etc. as a form of way of passing on the, you, I, don't want to, I don't want to call it wealth, but just passing on a little, the legacy that we've been able to build while we're alive yeah. to onto, you know, in Ghana is here too. Call it, call it wealth. Wealth is not only material. Yeah. It comes in other ways. Yeah. Yeah. It's family stories, family history, uh, genetics, which I like how Veles Baadis is strong. Wealth is, is all encompassing. Yeah. We mustn't just keep it to properties and money and those things. Lots to talk about. A lot has happened this past week. How the electricity crisis is literally yo, disturbing us in South Africa. Some of us are business owners. Some mm. of us are always online. We are under attack through this, um, you know, energy crisis that we are on in South Africa. Maybe let's start there. No, no, I don't even think we're going to start there, Wispo. So the other disclaimer I wanted to add for the squatters that are tuning in is we normally don't record these episodes on the day that you're watching them. We record them before. So between when we're recording them and when you get them, there might be certain information that you miss. So what had happened is one of the episodes we dropped on a Monday was after Kiernan and Tibelo had been shot. And because we shot, we shot the episode... <laughs> Because we had filmed the episode before they had been shot, you're almost like, but why are you guys not speaking about this thing? And it's, yeah. it's because of that. So there's news that have dropped on the day or around the day that we're recording this that I, I wanted to speak about. So I just want, if there's something happens between now and, and when the episode drops, I just want to apologize for that. And then the other thing, since we speak about family, is I need to take accountability. And I'm just going to add this. I am a father of six children from four mothers. And many people, for many reasons, believe I'm reckless. They believe I'm creating single mother uh, households, etc. And I don't think I'm a malicious person. And I never went out to go and get women pregnant and to leave them with children. I believe I'm a present father. I believe I contribute to my children. I'm not a deadbeat, etc. My children love me. I've posted videos and pictures, etc. But I understand the power of the family unit. And in the last three years, I am in my own way trying to figure out how I can build a stronger family unit AM with the mothers of my kids, with my children. Um, if I'm going to have, let's say, other partners, how do I build strong relationships with with them, where I have stepchildren and there are maybe other fathers, you know, because this is where we are now. We call it blended families. Yeah. So please know that on my side as a personal thing, I am also a work in progress. I'm a man trying to figure himself out, find out 
what works, what doesn't work, because I'm also trying to build healthy relationships within myself and with my children and the stakeholders as a well. A quick emergency, and that's what I love about podcasts, not TV. Yeah. I'm quickly just going to run into, just quickly, just continue. I don't want us to stop. Um, let, let me, let me, I don't know if you'll be able to hear me. As long as, so I want to introduce the, the topic for today because I'm hoping Osbu is going to conduct an interview uh, asking me questions. So the CEO of ESCOM is a gentleman by the name of Andre Dereta. And Andre has been at ESCOM, I think, for the past three years. And he officially resigned in 2022. But then after resigning, he has had to serve his notice, which was meant to end March 2023. And in that time, things have happened. And one of the things that happened is that Andre went and he did an uh, interview uh, with uh, Annika, Annika, what's An Lawson, sorry, Annika Lawson on ETV. Very brilliant interview. Andre Tereta is very well spoken, very calm, very knowledgeable of his work. I know a lot of people have criticized him in the past as CEO of NAMPAC and other companies that he headed. And he came into ESCOM, which is a hugely contested political business space. Um, and a lot of people have judged him and a lot of people have supported him. But he, he basically bared his issues there because you must understand he was um, poisoned. He was poisoned with cyanide in his coffee. Uh, he almost passed away. If you go check the interview, you'll listen. He'll break down a lot of these things. And he unpacked a lot of the issues that we have at ESCOM. It had me triggered because one of the things that I've been saying on Twitter is this idea that you find that a majority of white people in this country, whether they are aware of it or not, still have this racist undertone core that holds them. And when they come and they criticize, or when we criticize Andre Tereta for failing on his mandate to stop load shedding, they quickly defend him. Meanwhile, when you look at the Matsila Koko, when you look at the Brian Molife, they are not given the same courtesy. So I found myself heated, and why are you guys defending this person and why not that person, et cetera, et cetera. But in that, I realized that there's a very important need for us to unpack a part of the history of ESCOM, a part of the history of our load shedding legacy of which we're going into 16 years of load shedding now, um, and what's led to where we are currently. Um, so as I said, I was hoping Uspusis would ask me the questions, but I think maybe let me start here before he comes back. A lot of people don't know the link between Amalashe coal and electricity. You're like, oh no, the coal is wet. We need coal to generate electricity. But the reality is that electricity for most people is generated by a turbine. So a turbine is the spinning thing with the magnet inside which generates electricity. What the coal does, or let me, let me take it step by step. The turbine needs to spin and something needs to spin the turbine. And what spins most turbines is steam. Where do you get steam from? You get steam from boiling water. Who is boiling the water? That's where now we start speaking about things like coal. Because Amalati, they burn longer than, let's say, wood or paper. So as a fossil fuel, you burn coal so that you can, you, you, you burn coal to boil water so that you can get steam. And then that steam then powers the turbines, which generate the electricity. Currently, people are speaking about nuclear. Nuclear uh, fission or fusion is a process where you're taking uranium, which is another commodity, and there's nuclear fission or fusion, which is a process which creates heat. And that heat apparently lasts longer, is more sustainable, is better for the environment than coal, and that becomes a, a conversation that needs to be raised. When it comes to something like solar, power from the sun, what the solar panels do, there's something called cells in these solar panels, which have something called photovoltaic, I don't know the terms. As, as I said, I, I gave a disclaimer that I'm not an energy expert. But they convert the sun's rays into energy, which then powers your geyser, powers your house. And sometimes if you have a battery, this power then powers your battery, just like normal electricity. And then you keep that power and you have something called an inverter for people that are hearing these terms. An inverter collects energy almost like a battery. And as soon as your normal transmission is cut off because of load shedding. This battery then powers back into the system and then you have energy, whether it is solar, whether it is through a, a generator. Generator uses diesel, uses petrol to again create the spinning effect with the magnet which creates electricity. So I just wanted to explain that. Then there's hydro which is water and there's also wind. Again, all of it is just with this effort of wanting to spin so that you can spin the turbines and generate electricity. 
I don't have the years here, and I know we're not going to have much time, so I'm just going to kind of browse over the history. For ESCOM to be where it is today, a, an engineer called Hendrik van der Beel came and built ESCOM into what it is today. He was commissioned by one of our leaders. I'm not sure if it was Jan Smuts at the time, one of our, our prime ministers. Hendrik van der Beel is a South African guy. He went to go and study in Germany. And then he came back. And when he came back, being summoned to come and serve the country, they said, look, please can you build these industrial institutions which we need to build a strong economy. ESCOM became one of those. And when it was built, it was built as a non-profit organization. What that means is it didn't have a profit motive as it does now. And the only thing it needed to do was to power the industries in South Africa, whether it is the mines, the commercial farms, the factories, so that we can have power as a nation. And then from there, Hendrik van der Peel went and he built ISCO, which does our steel. Today, ISCO has been bought by Metal Steel, which is the largest, if not the second largest, steel company in the world. Along with steel, he did Arms Corps, which does our weapons in the country. Our Arms Corps is falling apart. Danel, which is another state-owned enterprise, which does our weapons, is also falling apart, sadly. But Hendrik van der Peel was the guy who built these institutions. And at least for me, and a challenge to you squatters, is there is nothing stopping each and every one of you, especially if you've studied something like engineering, in building the next ESCOM that we need. Maybe even using alternative energies. There's nothing stopping you. You just need a government that has the will. You need people that are going to fund you to build the ESCOM of the future. To commemorate Hendrik van der Peel, there is a town named after him called Van der Peel Park, which is very well known for commodities, for power, and the like. The next thing I want to speak about is CODESA and the handing over of the apartheid government to the ANC government. So CODESA is an event and a negotiation that happened after the ANC and many other struggle liberation movements. The Pan-Africanist Congress, which is the PAC, the Inkata Freedom Party, which is the IFP, uh, Azapo, and many other organizations, black liberation organizations, they came and they fought the white apartheid government. And at, at some point they decided, look, we have been sanctioned by other countries. We need to sit down and have a conversation. And the CODESA negotiations happened. In those CODESA negotiations, there were certain decisions that were made. And unfortunately, you will not find the minutes and the decisions that have been made at CODESA. We can only assume, based on what we've seen now, whether it is building RTP homes, whether it is black economic empowerment, whether it is having certain black people placed in certain spaces, whether it was the white apartheid government being given farms, being put in certain spaces. Um, Eugene, is it Eugene de Kock, I think? Um, was it Eugene de Kock? But one of these, uh, of Voter Person, let me find the name for you. I think he was known as Dr. Death. Back in the apartheid days, Dr. Death. Uh, Voter Person, sorry. Voter Person is the guy's name, who is still working in South Africa in private healthcare and who is actually getting funded by the ANC government. So some of these decisions were made then. Cyril Ramaphosa was one of the chief negotiators. Someone like uh, Rolf Mayer was one of the chief negotiators at the time. And in my mind, one of my thoughts is this idea that at the CODESA negotiations, they had a discussion about energy and the future of energy. Because I'll tell you now, Nelson Mandela became the first democratically elected president, but then after him, Thabo Mbeki took over. And one of the things that he tried to do was to privatize ESCOM. And he failed to privatize ESCOM. And to this day, I'm trying to think that that agenda, which is probably a CODESA agenda, is still being rolled out where the ANC government, whoever they decided with at the time, they wanted to privatize uh, ESCOM. And that's why Utabo Mbegi, who had Jacob Zuma as his deputy at the time, they did not invest in power plants for maintenance to build. And those would only come later. I think Usbusis was back and maybe he'll want to say something before I carry on. Yeah, no, no, continue. I'm listening. Sure. So, so I was giving... Sorry, sorry to disturb your train. I, I, was, I was giving just a brief overview to the squatters of how electricity is generated using coal and how coal basically has to be burnt to boil water so that we can have steam and it's the steam that turns the turbines that generates electricity. Nuclear uses uranium. It's a process, nuclear fusion or fission, where it creates heat. It's more sustainable. It's very costly in this country. 
to, to have that. It'll probably take us 10 years, etc. And then I spoke about how solar works. I spoke about hydro, wind, uh, and then I touched on generators and inverters. Then I spoke about Hendrik van der Peel, um, who actually built ESCOM, being summoned by government leadership, the apartheid government, to come and build ESCOM. And I was challenging the squatters to say, there's nothing stopping any young boy, girl, doesn't matter whether you're black, white, Indian, Chinese, to be like Hendrik van der Peel and to build industries like ESCOM, ESCO, Arms Corps, and others today because you have the know-how. You just need the political will and you need the funding. And then I touched on, before you got here, CODESA and how I feel at CODESA where they negotiated the liberation movements and the apartheid government on how South Africa was going to be run moving forward. And I fundamentally believe because Utabo Mbegi tried to privatize ESCOM when he was president and he failed. It was rejected. I feel that at CODESA there was an energy discussion and one of them was maybe we need to privatize ESCOM and I feel like what's happening now is still a continuation of that we need to privatize because Utabo Mbegi, Jacob Zuma is his deputy, did not invest in power plants at the time. That only came later under Jacob Zuma's administration where they eventually, I think it was Gusile and Metupi, they finally funded those to say we actually need power plants but by then we were already in load shedding and we're turning, it's turning 16. Load shedding turns 16 this year. And then how does then nuclear play a role in, in that conversation? So nuclear is something that's been there for a while and it's a technology that is not as, so technology has history like everything else. For us, what is Shisamalashe to create steam for electricity? You can also burn wood. You can burn paper. So someone realized at some point that Amalashe, in South Africa at least, we've got about 200 to 400 years reserves. So we've got an abundance of coal, good quality coal, of which the best quality we export, sadly. We've got an abundance of coal, and it lasts for long. It burns for long. But in that technological spectrum, people then realize, would see, there's something better than coal, and that's burning uranium in this process called nuclear fission or fusion. To do that, which Russia is trying to do and other countries are trying to do, I think in South Africa it was quoted that we'll need one trillion rand and it will take about 10 to 15 years to enact that. So Jacob Zuma tried to introduce this because uh, a lot of the people that run the economy did not like Jacob Zuma, did not like his administration. They were like, no, there's going to be a lot of corruption. We're not interested. Some people that maybe don't like Russia were like, and worse, you guys are bringing Russia to the table, so it's a no from us. But I believe there are certain agendas and certain stakeholders that didn't want nuclear to happen. Now, with what we have, those same people are now saying, let's look into nuclear but as which an alternative so, which option. solution could have been better between nuclear, coal, energy? So that, that opens the discussion for alternative energy which everyone is speaking about now. We speak about climate change. We speak about looking into the environment. There's something called COP, which is a gathering of, of global states where they discuss energy and the environment. They're looking into renewables because they're like, we need to try and preserve and save the planet. Lendokshi Samalash is sending bad gases into the atmosphere. We're burning the ozone layer and, and, and. So now we're starting to look into an alternative energy mix, which we should have done years ago. And there's a story, and the squatters can go check it out, of Nikolai Tesla, who was a huge innovator back in the day. Uh, he was funded by a financier in America called J.P. Morgan, yeah. who was one of the men that built America. J.P. Morgan funded him to look into cars, electricity, and other innovations. And one of them that he came up with was sustainable, clean energy, but that was going to use water only. And apparently, the, as the conspiracy theory goes, he was shut down because it was going to ensure that people don't make money. So with nuclear now, as with cannabis in South Africa, um, as with anything, the people that want to make money and the powerful and the elites, they wait to see how can we control and own this? How can we make money from this before we roll it out? So nuclear is cleaner than coal. Uh, it burns better. There's an issue on nuclear waste and getting rid of it, which is radioactive. But apparently, according to them, it's not that bad now because they found solutions for it. But according to them, nuclear is better now. It, just, it costs a lot. They still need to roll it out. Because you know, as a country, we have a lot of coal. From a cost and a sustainability perspective, we should still run for coal with coal at least for the next 200 to 400 years while beginning to phase in alternative. And as the technology also gets better, we will then see what works. Should South Africans um, accept the current solution that is being proposed? I don't know if it's being proposed or if our president has already signed on it. 
because I heard it being announced overseas. I heard it being announced in the UK. Sure. And I also heard President Joe Biden uh, in America um, announcing it. Sure. Should the public accept it or is it just some form of a way of another colonization and uh, taking advantage of our country by the uh, global elites? You're asking a very deep question and I was, I was hoping to get to it later. So okay. w- when, I, when I started, I explained that what spurred this topic today is Andre Tereta, and maybe I didn't get to this, but he was the outgoing CEO of ESCOM. Yeah. They tried to poison him. There was cyanide found, and, and I think sodium uh, something that was found in a, in a coffee, in his coffee. Some people came to service their coffee machine. Next thing, he's getting sick. Apparently, it was an assassination attempt. Praveen Kordan, who is the minister of state-owned enterprises, said that he is meddling in politics. Um, and next thing we heard is that he has been released with immediate effect. So he was meant to serve his notice until the end of March 2023. But as, as we are recording this episode, he is officially no longer the CEO of ESCOM. And in that interview, he unpacks so many things. And I wanted to give a background of why we are here today. So I spoke about Hendrik van der Peel and the building of ESCOM, which was a nonprofit organization. Everything was meant to be done at cost to, to, to fire up the mines, the factories, the commercial farms, etc. We have a profit motive now, which it was never meant to be for. And then with the sanctions and with the liberation movements, there was a fighting and then the ANC took over. And then I'm saying that I think from there, even though ESCOM was a state company then, I think there was an agenda to privatize, not just ESCOM, but probably a lot of other industries, of which maybe arms is one of them. I'm speaking about Arms Corps and Danel, of which both of them have been destroyed by government. But you've got a company such as the Paramount Group. The Paramount Group is the chairman and the founder is a gentleman by the name of Ivo Ichikovitz. Ivo Ichikovitz is one of the friends and business partners of another gentleman called Robert Kumete, who founded Kijima. Robert Kumete, as people may have seen on, on social media, is the father of Simpio Kumete, or Sim Dope, who was one of the closest friends of, of Kian and Forbes. Um, Ivoy Chikovitz has a company called Paramount Group, which manufactures all types of weapons. You can go check them out online. The Paramount Group on Google, you'll see them. I am not saying anything to do with them. All I know is that they are a private company that manufactures weapons. So it gets me thinking, companies like that are gonna make more money when a Danel and an arms core fall apart. So I feel there's been a privatization agenda, and some people might feel it's a white supremacist agenda, where it's like, we cannot let black people run the country and the state, and these resources and these assets we've built. So we need to get them back. And how we do that is these ANC leaders we've sent must do the work for us. That's why I'm saying, it's my theory, my opinion, that Otabo Mbegi will be tasked, go in and, and privatize an SAA, and privatize maybe an SAPC, because you must understand Mnet, Multi-Choice, and DSTV blossomed when the ANC took over power. SAPC was the broadcaster, but all of a sudden there's this private uh, paid broadcaster that's now making a lot of money. So I feel they were tasked, go and sell ESCOM back to us or to whoever our stakeholders are. It was rejected. And now we've been seeing this triple effect. I'm gonna try and do this as quick as possible, then we can go to the questions. So after Tabumbek, Jacob Zuma came in. Jacob Zuma came in with his radical economic transformation, apparently group of faction. To be honest, radical economic transformation is an ANC policy. It's not a Jacob Zuma policy. It was something that was decided at an ANC conference. It was meant to be rolled out to this day. It hasn't been rolled out because it comes on from the liberation movement where black people with the Freedom Charter were saying things like, we want the land back. The black consciousness movement of Stephen Bantubigo or Robert Mangaliso, Mangaliso Sobu where and the PAC, all of them were saying, Funum to Owatato during apartheid. We want our land back. And also, on Nelson Mandela were championing, we want to nationalize the mines. We want to nationalize the banks. We want to nationalize industry. And Nelson Mandela went, met with Margaret Thatcher, went to the World Economic Forum. All of a sudden, he comes back and he changes his tune. So it was literally saying radical economic transformation must happen. And it was around those times that Julius Malima was fighting as an ANC Youth League leader and left to form the economic freedom fighters to say, we still want the land for the people. We still want to nationalize, etc. But Jacob Zuma comes in and when he comes in, he deploys his own people. And what happens when he deploys them is then this family of the Kuptas now becomes prominent. And the Kuptas are accused of coming in to come and be corrupt, etc., etc. 
And in their corruption, apparent corruption, we are now exposed to things at ESCOM we never knew existed. Things like evergreen contracts. Things like finding out who actually owns these mines that supply the coal. Who are the biggest tenderpreneurs at ESCOM? So now we're being exposed. And Jacob Zuma, whether directly or indirectly, has always been brilliant at this thing of, when you attack me, all I do is I put up a mirror so that people can see who, to, who is attacking me. Jobaniti, Uzuma is corrupt. Nioba ni na Jobani mkom. So that's what happened, and we realized the Guptas, I think 3 to 5% of the coal is what they were supplying. And to this day, a lot of people still don't know who's supplying the bulk, of which now we've started hearing names, which I'm going to raise later, of who was supplying. In that time, Brian Mulife came in, Matsila Koko came in, and they made a mistake, in my opinion. 2016, 2017, they stopped load shedding, which now, according to my conspiracy, doesn't fit the agenda of privatize. Because if people are not going to willingly privatize, uh, I think Noam Chomsky, one of the greatest intellectuals of our time, speaks about if you want to privatize something that's public, you need to break it and make it look like it doesn't work. So that people are like, I, since our public hospitals don't work, let me get medical aid. I, since our public schools don't work, let me go to a private school. You need to make these things dysfunctional so that everyone can be like, actually, we agree. Privatize these things. So what happens now is ESCOM needs to be broken for it to be privatized. Because if it's working, or Brian Mulifo are posting profit. We didn't have load shading for two years. Now, all of a sudden, we've got a Zondo commission. And in that commission, those same guys are being implicated for corruption. I'm not defending them. They might be corrupt. They were linked to the Guptas because under Brian Molife, the Guptas ended up getting a mine. But that mine started supplying coal to ESCOM at a cheaper rate than some of the incumbents there. Again, you're being summoned, just like Hendrik van der Peel was summoned to build ESCOM. You are being summoned to come and serve because we need to fix this thing. But that's now called corruption. And again, Jobang Yishu Zuma was good at, if you're saying this is wrong, how did these other people get mines? How did these other people get to supply ESCOM? And now we start asking questions. During that same time, of course, you had a Dudumian at SAA who ex exposed that only 3% of the suppliers at SAA are black, which means SAA as a state-owned enterprise is, is not transformed. You had someone like Khawudi Mutsuaneng at the SAPC as the chief operations officer saying, we need to support local. And there were people fighting him. And you're like, why? Why, why do you have an issue with supporting local when this, this is a, a state-owned South African enterprise, the SAPC? So, so a lot of those discussions were, were being raised at that time. The Zondo Commission, Brian Mulife went and then he pointed. He said, Cyril Lamaposa is the deputy president of the ANC under Jacob Zuma was head of the war room at ESCOM meant to solve some of these problems. Yet at the same time, he had a conflict of interest. He owned a company called Shanduga, and Shanduga was in partnership with a multinational called Glencoe, and they were supplying coal to ESCOM. Not cheaply like the Guptas, but at a huge premium. That's a conflict of interest. And he believes the way all Cyril and all Glencoe got their contracts is not right, but no one is investigating that. Chief Justice Raymond Zondo, when asked, why are you not investigating this, says there isn't a budget. Says, no, this is not what we're here for. Later on, after the commission's done, Brian Mulifo and Matsila Koko are now being arrested for corruption. But these other things are not being interrogated. The same time, a Glencoe globally is being fined for rampant corruption. But in this country, for some weird reason, there's no corruption. In a country where the president is in business with these people. And mind you, Cyril Ramaphosa in 2018 committed that now that he's coming back into politics, he will put Tishanduga and all his business interests into a blind trust. And he was exposed in parliament last year in 2022 that he has not done that when he was being asked about Palapal and those things. People can go research these articles where he said, you said you would put this in a blind trust. He hasn't. What he did say he would do at the time, which is still happening now, is Tishanduga was handed over to a company called Pembani for, to babysit, basically. Pembani is run by a really great businessman called Uputu Mantlego, who used to be a head of MTN. When you dig deep into some of these relationships now, because I spoke about Brian Mulife, Matila Koko, they stopped load shedding, they were removed. After them, other people took over. Then we had Andre Tereta. But in all this time before we get to Andre, you realize a deputy president of a country, who's a president now, is supplying coal at a premium with a Glencore, which is known as a very corrupt company in the world, but for some reason it's not corrupt here. His company is being babysat by Uputu Mantlego under Pembani, and Pembani has got shares in Engine. Glencoe itself, I think, has taken over, it might be Caltex, I, I stand to be corrected, which is now being called Astron Energy. 
With the load shedding that we've now gotten back and under underrate the rate as at its worst ever, ESCOM needs to be run on generators which require a lot of diesel. Millions of rands every single day of diesel. Then you have to ask, where is this diesel coming from? It comes from uh, Petro SA, largely. But Petro SA has to get some of the diesel from certain suppliers. One of the suppliers named is Astron Energy, which is under Glencore. Glencore is in partnership with Shanduga, which is under our president. Petro SA also gets fuel from Engine. Engine, which is under Pembani. Pembani, which is under Putumantlego. Putumantlego, who is babysitting in Shanduga for Sal Ramaphosa. So you start realizing the conflicts of interest. And in the interview that Andre Tereta gave, he touched on so many different points. One of them being, and a lot of people don't know this, the ANC has got an investment arm called Chancellor House. Chancellor House is a, a, an organization, a private investment company, which was named after the building that Nelson Mandela and Oliver Tambo were running from, they're running their law firm from. It raises investments, it makes money to fund the ANC. Chancellor House did a deal with a Japanese company called Hitachi. Hitachi came and they built the power stations for a lot of money, which today those power stations, the amounts have been inflated insanely. And they've been caught in America by the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission for Corruption, again. And the Chancellor House and the ANC's made money from that deal. Similarly, when we're at the state of emergency under COVID, which we now have a state of emergency with energy, another company got brought in, a Turkish company called Car Powership. Ka Car Powership. Car Powership. Okay. K-A-R, Powership. Yeah. Which are these ships which connect to the grid to generate electricity. 20-year contract, which didn't follow processes for billions of rands. The spokesperson there is the niece of Tokyo Sihwali. When you look at some of the stakeholders that own a stake in Car Powership SA, you realize these are connected people. So now you start seeing that Andre Tereta speak about the problems at ESCOM, and I'm going to list some of the ones he raised. But you realize the, the conflicts of interest with politicians, with business people, to bring us here. And before I even speak about Andre, you realize that there are people that have a vested financial interest in privatization and in load shedding. We haven't gotten to independent power producers, but just before we speak about Andre, there are people like the president of this country. There are people like, um, I'm gonna mention names and I apologize, but these are things that are out there. One of the major coal suppliers to ESCOM is a, is a mining company called Seriti, of which the person who's the head there is a, a, a quality businesswoman called Dr. Anna Mohokong. She was one of the people that sat in the BEE commission which was chaired by Sil Ramaphosa back in the day when they decided to, to dish BEE deals to themselves. Cyril, Dr. Anna Mohokong, Mzi Kumalo, Lazarus Zim, Saki Matozom, and other connected people at the time. Seriti is there. Um, I think it's Seriti. I hope I'm not mistaken, but I know this. It's either that mine or another mine, but you've got a huge businessmen like Mike Deke, I think Zico Investments, which is also involved, which is the Black Business Council, which last I checked, one of the Mutsipe ladies, which is Cyril's sister-in-law, sits in one of the executive committees there. These people make money from a dysfunctional ESCOM. Number one, they supply coal, so they already make money. Number two, even when there's load shading, some of these people supply the fuel. When things go private, some of these people stand to benefit from independent power producers and the like. So that's where we are as a country. And I just wanted to speak about our energy issues to paint somewhat of a picture. I haven't seen the three hour conversation, but I hope the squatters will check it out with Tsepo, uh, Khadi, Khadi Meng, I think. So I don't want to mess up his name. On the King David podcast um, with David Mashabele, where I think he breaks down the issues uh, at ESCOM because Utsepo is an ex-CEO, I believe, of Petro SA. I just want to get his name. Tsepo Khadima. Sorry. Tsepo Khadima on the King, King David podcast. I think I'll stop there for now. Sorry. There was a lot of information at once. It's beautiful information because a lot of us don't know. You know, the masses out there, don't, there's no sharing. 
it just happened. Of course. You've just heard the, it's become a norm in South Africa. Yes. It's like it's become normalized. Sure. And it's like, is this what you're saying? Is this, I, I can just imagine my mother like fathoming all of this. Is this intentional? Yeah. Are you saying this is intentional for us to go through this so that it can be privatized? So people out there can make huge amounts of monies out of it, out of our South African government moving forward through those very big contracts. We're in a very um, interesting position because where we are, we've got an overload of information all over the internet. Yeah. Also, we've got a lot of us who are not aware of what is actually going on behind the scenes. Yeah. It's actually applaud I'd like to applaud you for having, I don't want to say you've done research, but I mean, your mind is so amazing that you're able to put it in that way and simplify it for us, the masses who do not understand, because we just want to understand why can't this be solved? Can it be solved by people voting the ANC government out of power? Can it be solved by our current president, Cyril Ramaphosa, being replaced by another president? How does this get solved? So one of the things that uh, defeats me personally is I was speaking to Umchasto, uh, who does our production, and explaining there's a, there's a very beautiful prayer. Lord, grant me the serenity um, to know things, uh, to understand things that I cannot change. Uh, grant me the courage to be able to change the things that I can. And then grant me the wisdom to know the difference. I've had to learn that there are things that I cannot change. So serenity is peace. Grant me the peace to understand that there are things I cannot change. And I realize for the, the masses of South Africans, there are things we cannot change because they are beyond our power, comprehension, etc. Grant me the courage and the bravery to change the things that I can. And for us now, this is what it is. It's the bravery to educate, which at least let us let you guys know what's happening. I dropped a lot of names and maybe you can rewind and it's not, there's too much information. I wanted people to go and research some of these people on their own. Chancellor House, I know they're not the only funding agency for, for, for the ANC. There's a company called Tebe Investments that people must look up as well. You can go look them up. They're there, it's available. I wanted people to go and research something like the BEE Commission, when it was founded, what decisions were made from there, etc. We'd like people to go and research Glencore. Research all their scandals in the, in the DRC, in Libya, around the world. It's a, it's a company that was born of Mark Rich and Company, who was at some point the most wanted man in America, and he couldn't go to America anymore because of some of the things he was doing, funding uh, or, or supplying oil to the apartheid government at some point, dealing with sanctioned countries. Mark Rich, someone worth looking up. Ivan Klossenberg, who's the ex-CEO of, of Glencore. Someone like Ivo Chikovitz of the Paramount Group. Him and Robert Kumete at some point owned the Lions Rugby Club in South Africa, I mean, in, in Johannesburg, sorry. Um, Car Powership, a Turkish company. And look at some of, of their scandals and the family that's involved and the people that are involved. Um, I mentioned Hitachi, a Japanese company which has been found for corruption and whatever. There are things that we can do and things we cannot do. So let me, let me now maybe speak about Andre Tereita. Yeah. So I've criticized Andre Tereita a lot, not for him. Number one, he's got a bad record for himself. The, the, the companies he's been CEO of, he's, he's basically destroyed them. And a lot of people criticize that. From NAMPAC days, right? NAMPAC is one of them. There's another company people normally reference. So people would be like, why are you bringing this guy in? He's not even enge an engineer. Matsila Koko, for example, is an engineer. So he kind of has the qualification. Why this guy? And for a lot of pro-black people, you need to understand a lot of these people are deployed. So you might criticize him, but some of these people are placed by the same black politicians that you guys vote for. Black board of directors that is meant to look after your interests. So you need to ask them. You need to ask a Kwede Mantash, who's the Minister of Mineral Resources and Energy. You need to ask a Praveen Kordan. You need to ask your presidents, why this guy? He didn't appoint himself. He didn't say, so by CEO Namshanj, you know. So outside of his track record, I've watched him, I've listened to him. And even this interview with Annika Larson is pretty dope. I think everyone should go check it out. I'm not bashing him. I have an issue with the hypocrisy of mainstream media in this country, where when a Cyril Ramaphosa has to run things, he's not held to the same account as a Jacob Zuma. 
When Andre Tereita is failing to power this country, he's not held to the same standard as a Matsila Koko. You know, and there's a gentleman on Twitter who said something so dope because he was responding to back and forth on a tweet I posted saying, Yazi, you white people are very funny because when, when it comes to apartheid, when black people say, but we are in this mess because of apartheid, you white people are like, no, but that's in the past. Look at the ANC now. And when we're telling you, look at uh, Andre Tereita now, you say, no, but look at the previous black CEOs. That's hypocrisy. That's cognitive dissonance. So I don't like the fact that Andre Tereita has gotten a lot of protection from mainstream media. I don't like the fact that he has been given such huge leeway by Praveen Kordan. Gwede Mantashe now started ruffling the feather and Praveen got angry now because of this interview. But before that, the guy was protected the same way as Cyril Ramaphosa is protected. He can almost do no wrong. When he has got conflicts of interest in business, when certain things are happening at a, at a game farm, when he is seen doing somewhere, when some of his business associates are eating, I think he was chairman of Bidvest, and Bidvest is one of the biggest entrepreneurs in the country. Then it's fine, it's fair play. But when a Jacob Zuma is coming with another, that's problematic, and I'm not defending Jacob, I'm just saying, can we not hold him to the same standard? Andre Tereta came in, and one of the really dope questions that Annika asked him is, do you believe you failed? And he answered very beautifully, because he speaks very well. He said, as far as some of the face value things, definitely, if you look at the load shedding, it's gotten worse. But then he explained some of the other things where he feels his, the income statement looks better. The balance sheet looks better because I think he lowered debt by like $50 billion, et cetera. He's very big on climate change, he said. He's very big on pushing for renewables, which is problematic for someone like myself and for the country because if we're in a state we're in now, things like renewables can't be a conversation. Fix this now. We've got low coal for days. Fix the power. Use Amalache once Ukesu Ukraine. Then let's speak about alternatives. Andre Tereita speaks about, and Gaten McKenzie highlighted this in, in a dope three-piece post in December, mid-December 2022. I thought if we had time today, I'd read it because it's very long. Read but it, I, it's fine. I challenge people, if I don't get a chance, if I don't get a chance, okay. please go and read Gaten McKenzie. It's a three-part series um, of what he thinks is wrong with ESCOM. And I think in the third part, this is on Facebook. In the third part, he goes and he gives solutions. And he's put his hand up to say, I will sort out ESCOM. But Andre Tereta breaks down basically what Gaten was highlighting, that there are mafias at ESCOM that are the reason we have load shedding. So ESCOM has got a huge number of issues. And it's interesting that Andre didn't raise some of them. One of them being, there are many people that are illegally connected in this country. And if you look at a bulk of our townships, I know there's an article on Alex. There's an article on the townships, Eguruleni. Over 60% of the township is illegally connected. So we thought, yo, it's black people in Makas. Then with Tswane, and it went nationwide, we started seeing government departments that are not paying their bills. We started seeing estates in suburbs that were not paying their bills. We started seeing big malls and big companies, white-owned companies, that are not paying their bills. So we realized there are a lot of people that are illegally connected, and there are a lot of people that are not paying their bills. So that has been exposed, and that's one thing that he didn't touch on. The things he did touch on was there's a coal mafia. Gaten McKenzie spoken about this. It's something that him and I have discussed privately as well. There's a coal mafia that ensures that they are always supplying coal at a premium. And sometimes they do things that are as crazy as taking rocks and painting them black to supply. And then you can't burn the rocks. Because like I explained earlier, how you generate electricity is that you have to burn the coal so that it can boil water and then generate steam. You can't burn the rocks to do that. So there are people that go to that extent. There are mafias within the tenders because every time a power station gets broken, someone needs to be called in to come and fix it and maintain it. So some of those people pay people inside ESCOM to go and sabotage certain things because once there's a pothole, as an example, once something I spy and you need to dispatch someone and those people need to invoice and get paid. Then he spoke about some of the dangerous people and as I was listening to him, because I know the power of propaganda and narrative, he speaks about the comrades and the ANC. If you listen to him, you would be convinced that all of these problems are black people. But one of the things that I've challenged on Twitter is, who are the biggest tender premiers at ESCOM? Who are the people that make the most money at ESCOM? Because no one wants to show us that. You just think it's probably some 
black cater somewhere at a Cubana or at a Conca. Look at who makes the most money in tenders at ESCOM. Look at who makes the most money from the coal mines at ESCOM. Because those are the people that have a vested interest with things not working. As I said earlier, who are the people that are supplying diesel to ESCOM when there's load shedding? Those are the people. And then you can go even further. Who are the people that are supplying the solar panels? Who are the people selling the generators at, at the highest level? Because those people don't want this country to be fixed. Which are the banks? And right now, ESCOM has got a, 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 a chairman, Umpo Makwana, who I think he's just been removed now, but he was the chairman of NetBank. And in NetBank, it just rolled out a fund for alternative green energy and solar, which is a direct conflict of interest. Would this guy, who's the chairman here, want ESCOM to be fixed if there's a direct interest here who is chairman as well for NetBank to make money from alternative and green? So look at the banks. The banks are now rolling out funding for solar. If you want, to, if you want solar in your house, we can fund you. If you the banks don't want ESCOM to be fixed because then they lose money from that. Then you look at the external, which now goes to your question now. You've got an $8.5 billion fund that has come through Sil Ramaphosa from the West to say, you guys must go alternative. And yet the West, Germany, one of the top three biggest economies in the world, America, Europe, they are buying our coal like never before. Yet they are telling us who are coal rich to get off coal. Why? And why would you fund us? And people that understand the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, people that understand the World Bank will understand that these people go around funding countries that are struggling, normally at crazy interest rates, because they want you to fail so that you can't pay back, so that they now have a stake. It's like repossession. Ellerine's brothers used to do it with, with furniture. They will sell you furniture at a high interest rate you cannot afford, they collect your money. As soon as you can't pay back, they come and they repossess that furniture and then they sell it again and it starts all over again. But at IMF World Bank uh, level, these people now have a stake to your land, to your mines, because China has done it as an example. And this is why BRICS is also not the greatest solution. In Russia, their energy minister was here recently, you know, and they have a lot of gas. These people on the African continent will come and build a port. They will come and build power stations. They will come and capacitate a mine. As soon as you can't pay them back, they're like, since you can't, we'll take the mine. We'll take the port. All of a sudden, our harbors, Richards Bay, Durban, all of a sudden, maybe Ogusile, Medupi, Machuba, Tutuga, all of a sudden, you'll find out they're owned by the Chinese. Why? So the sovereignty you of couldn't the country pay. is now gone. It's gone. If your factory is not behaving, we'll switch you off because we now own the power. We have a monopoly, of which the monopoly was ESCOM, and it's now being broken up with independent power producers, which some of us now are saying, maybe bring them, because you guys have been wanting this thing forever. Give Patrice Mutsipe, which has happened, 12 of the 25 licenses. Who handed him those licenses? His brother-in-law, Jeff Khatebe, who was a minister in the presidency. Who signed that off? His other brother-in-law, Cyril Ramaphosa, the president of the country. Now we found out Johan Rupert, who is the father of the country, because he's one of the wealthiest men here. Remcro, his company here, his holding company, now has been awarded a license as well as an independent power producer. Who else is getting the licenses? Jeff Khatia, before a long time, didn't want to give the list. No, state security. How did Cow Powership get this 20-year tender to plug into our grid? How did Hitachi work with Chancellor House, an ANC company, to get the things that they're getting? My point is this. Andre Tereita dropped a lot of truths. Facts, Gates and McKenzie raised them. There are mafias that have an invested financial stake in ESCOM, whether it succeeds or it fails. Local mafias, small tenderpreneurs, the really big tenderpreneurs, your construction guys, your, the bid vests, the big suppliers, the, the mining guys. No one seems to want to talk about Glencore. And one of the things he alluded to is that some of the people that have a stake at ESCOM have a stake at Transnet. And Glencore has just come out recently because Transnet is broken. Again, another parastatal, state-owned enterprise that they're saying, destroy this thing so we can privatize. And Glencore has come out and said in an article in the last week or two saying, we believe Transnet will be solved by a public-private partnership. This is the same Glencore that is working with the president's company, Shandua. So I won't be surprised if a Cyril, if a Figili Mbalula, who's the secretary general of the ANC and the minister of transport says, look, we've decided to set out a tender for, we're welcoming private partnerships to fix Transnet. 
And I won't be surprised if Astron Energy is one of them. I won't be surprised if Glencore is one of them. I won't be surprised if Engine and, and Pembani and any other connected company gets involved in saying, we will fix Transnet. One of the funny, thing for, funny things for an EFF and other pro-black people that are like, leave our state-owned enterprise alone. Don't privatize ESCOM. ESCOM is already privatized because the bulk of the suppliers are private companies. The bulk of the money being made is by private companies. What exactly are you protecting? Out of that bulk, is a bulk of them all black owned? No. That's why, that's why I'm challenging people to say, go and find out. Go and get a list of the biggest tender, not just at ESCOM. Do to me and expose this at, the, at SAA. Go look at Transnet. Go look at government as a whole. Demand of the ANC, demand of the EFF, since these are black parties. Guys, and let's come be see list of the biggest entrepreneurs in this country and who owns those companies. We'd like to see. There's a reason why those guys don't want because some of them are invested there. Whether they have shares, whether they have board seats, whether they are funded by some of these people. Because I'll, I'll give you an easy example. I was not needed on this episode, guys. Penuel is on a roll today. I'm going to shift out. I just want you to go on. Go on, bro. Go on, bro. Go on. Go on. Bro. We are happy. Go on. Go on, bro. We are happy. Go on, bro. Go on. Bro. Go on, 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 bro. Go on. I wanted to make an example of. I mentioned Bitvest. I'm going to mention another one, which is Aspen. Aspen Pharmaceuticals. Aspen was co founded by two gentlemen, one of them being Stephen Saad. Stephen Saad is a Jewish. Very great businessman and a very great gentleman himself. But Aspen got the monopoly tender on ARVs, antiretrovirals for HIV positive people when they got rolled out. I think today there's three or four major suppliers of ARVs. When the COVID vaccine, vaccine in inverted commas, was being rolled out in South Africa, guess who got the monopoly to manufacture those? Same company, Aspen. Stephen Saad is a huge fund of the ANC. And he was one of the big funders of the CR17 campaign, funding Cyril Ramaphosa. These are things now that you guys have to go and research and the information is out there on Google. These are not things that I'm sucking from somewhere. These are not things that maybe I've got an inside lane on. These are things that you can go and research yourself. What I was trying to explain to Usbud about, grant me the peace to accept things I cannot change and grant me the courage to change things I can is, I realized for, for the masses of South Africans, the masses of South Africans are poor. They have survival issues. Where will I get food? Where can I get a job to earn money? Where can I get a grant? They don't care about the fights at the top. Whether ESCOM is private or public, they don't care. They don't care if Cyril's got a conflict of interest or Jacob Zuma's working with the Guptas. These people don't care. When they go to vote, they vote because they, I'm voting for a grant. I'm voting for an RDP. I'm voting for NSFAS. I am voting for a basic job. So these fights that we have end up being middle class fights for those of us who are clever blacks because we have access to this information. But we are too scared to get involved, to get into politics, which is very dirty, to get into big business, which is very, we're scared. So we end up just making noise. But the responsibility for people like myself is to be like, since I have all this information and knowledge, maybe let me share it with you. And I'm going to give a shout out. I know he's going to fucking love this. I'm going to give a shout out to Ntlamulo Baloy, Unota, because in the last episode of the Penrill Show, he touched on Chancellor House, Hitachi, Car Powership. Uh, I know Rutendo <laughs> Matinyarare, who is seen as a ZANU PF uh, spokesperson, which he said that he's not, but he's defended the ANC. But he understands some of these dynamics and nuances and something I've challenged him on that you want us to support this political party which is conflicted. And his counter argument is, look, if you get rid of the ANC, it's just going to be worse. And it's a question that Usbuda asked me. Should we remove the ANC? And will things get better? The thing is, if you remove the ANC, who are you putting in? The DA, which is the official opposition? What has the DA with the power it's had in the Western Cape done for the majority of black people? The Mitchell's Plain, the Cape Flats. What has the Democratic Alliance done for those poor people there? 
What has the Democratic Alliance done in Gauteng where they've had power in Tswane, in Eguruleni, in Johannesburg, for the townships and the poorest of the poor there? Because it seems for a lot of, for a lot of, not all, but for a lot of white people, they just want the DA to maintain their privilege, which the ANC has done a great job of, by the way, since 1994, because white people in this country have gotten wealthier since the ANC got into power. If you look at BEE as a policy, 80% of the money that has been generated through BEE has landed up in white companies and white hands. So you have to ask yourself, which agenda is the ANC pushing? It seems like there's a white agenda, and then it seems like there's an elite black agenda. And it's very disturbing for people like myself. Let me see some of the notes I wanted to say. Let me touch on this before I, 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 I forget. I'm just going to mention. The white apartheid government, when they were in power, industrialized a big chunk of South Africa. And thanks to them, we had a lot of institutions that we bu were built. I mentioned, of course, ESCOM, ISCO, Arms Corps. Um, you've got companies like Telcom. Um, there were private companies that were built. Naspers, Media24, MultiChoice, Sunlam, Falskas, which turned into APSA, uh, Afkri, as an example, and so many others. It looked like the South African economy was going some, somewhere. Of course, it was, that, it was at the expense of the majority of the black people who were shafted off their land and who were not given a chance to play into the mainstream economy. It seems that those white Afrikaners during that time learned a lot of things in building institutions. And some of them today are the same people that have now built an Orania. And if you've been studying Orania, 50% of their power is now off-grid from ESCOM. They've gone solar. They've built solar farms. And they are now looking to be 100% off the grid. And they're not the only ones. A group, I know I get chastised for this quite a lot, but it's fine. Afri Forum right now is looking into nuclear and looking into helping some of their members go off grid. Because they realize that we're not getting anywhere. And because they've got the experience of building institutions, of building industry, they're saying we're going to use that to then build for ourselves so that when ESCOM is destroyed, so that when other spaces are destroyed, we can then say we are off-grid, and maybe in time going on, Orania, Afri Forum, and some of these guys are gonna end up selling us energy that we desperately need, because they've done that in other spaces as well. I think the last point I wanna make is this, before I speak about the mafias again. The ANC government has spoken about a national health insurance, NHI. They wanna remove private healthcare, and they want everyone to use public health care. A lot of people have been angry, but you guys have failed. Why will you do better? Look at what's happened to the state-owned enterprises. When you look at the pack of NHI, you see the same names. MediClinic is looked at as a potential partner. I think it was William Kese was driving some of this when he was still Minister of Health. MediClinic is under Remcro and Johan Rupert. Discovery was one of the partners they were looking into. Adrian Gore, I think Rob Hershoff has called out people like Adrian Gore to say, but Adrian, you guys are funding the ANC and Cyril, and you guys are letting our country go to shit. So again, when you look at what's happening in our country, a lot of people, oh, it's a black government. It's a black government where some of these politicians sit on boards of big white-owned companies. Some of these big white-owned companies are the biggest entrepreneurs in the country and in the government. And some of them are the biggest private sector companies that supply our politicians and our government and us. So you realize that there's this very unhealthy relationship at the top. The middle class, us clever blacks, all we do is make noise on social media. And then the poor masses, the people who should really, really matter, those guys don't fucking care. Because as long as I've got an RDP, a grant, my child is studying for free, my child is being fed at school, my child can get NSFAS. I will keep voting for the same people. You middle class people, you can go sure. scream and cry on your own. Sure, sure, sure. I've just been schooled today. Continue, I, bro. Don't stop. I, I want to make my last point. Continue. It's not your last point. Continue. My last two points. Okay. Andre Tereta and the Mafia. So I believe some of the Mafias that Andre Tereta was speaking to are not just black, politically connected people. I believe a lot of them are white, politically connected people. Anyone who's in mining, anyone who's in trucking and logistics, 
um, will know that mining in this country is still dominated by white Afrikaners. Just like farming, commercial farming in this country is still dominated by white Afrikaners. So when you see these mines that are supplying, please know. Go Pumalanga, go Northwest where there's platinum. Please know, <laughs> even in places like Zimbabwe, if you were to go and visit some of those mines, those also Kulumis Africa and say, you hundred, I say, you're right. And you're like, hey, bo, are you, yeah, I'm from South Africa. White Afrikaners. That's the first part I want to say, that those mafias are not just black people. And it's not just local people again. I've mentioned Glencore, but there's a whole lot of other invested companies. Some of them being BHP Billiton, South 32, Gates and McKenzie spoken about them as well. These multinational mines that make a lot of money from this country. And a lot of them sell coal at a premium. And not only do they sell coal at a premium to ESCOM, they also are given because the bulk of our energy actually goes to business, not residential. A lot of them, they buy electricity at a huge discount to the rest of us. The electricity we get is probably two or three times as expensive as these big mines, these big factories, mm. these big manufacturing plants, mm. etc. This is what I wanted to say and what white people in particular need to understand. I, I made a video on Penuel the Black Pen, which is a message to white South Africans. I hope you guys will go check it out where I'm speaking to angry white people to give them some type of perspective and why defending the DA blindly and why you guys not, don't understand why a lot of black people will continue to vote ANC and EFF. South Africa is a piece of land. On this piece of land, there is water, the rivers, then there's the dams, there's the natural resources such as coal, gold, platinum, uranium, gas. We've got our animals, the big five, of course. Then we've got cows, sheep, goats, etc. of which Onungawuse went and were convinced to, to kill their livestock in the Eastern Cape, which is a tragic story. We've got beautiful scenery, amazing coastline. We've got happy people that are creative, that sing and dance. We've got Osarafina, Ubom, the Lion King, etc. Outside of that are man-made things. And these man-made things before colonizers, British colonizers came here, was an African way of living with our kings and our queens and our chiefs. And we had our way of living of wound. And we farmed and we built. And we built homes that white people today called eco-friendly and green. Our homes were built with mud. They were built with cow dung. They were built with straw and thatch. We lived in harmony with nature. Something that Ongamla are only getting to now. We, before you guys came with herbal and organic, our medicine came from the earth. It was not processed medicine with crazy side effects. We were living the life that a lot of progressive white people are trying to move to now. When you guys go for a tan because you want to be healthy and, you know, we have natural melanin. That's why we were topless and we were enjoying what we had. The colonizers came and they exploited and they enslaved and they killed and them and the Afrikaners, who are the Dutch, the French, the Germans, came and shifted people off their land in what we today called crimes against humanity, which the late F.W. de Klerk denied. At some point, I think Afri Forum, some of the things I criticized them for, I think they denied as well. But a lot of people are like, okay, okay, it's crimes against humanity, apartheid. They did those things to the majority of black people. And one of the questions I've asked people like Rob Hersoff when I speak to him and we debate these things. Some of the things I ask some of my white friends when they're like, yo, but look at the ANC government. Look at what black people are doing. Look at Jacob Zuma and the Guptas. Look at Ace Mahashule and Didi Mabuza. I asked them in a country like ours, beautiful as it was before human beings came and fucked it up. Where we can agree that for this country to be where it is today, there were a lot of crimes and atrocities committed. And we now have to abide by a constitution which protects and defends those crimes. There's something called private land ownership, which Cyril Ramaphosa, speaking to white people in Stellenbosch and elsewhere said, we have got a constitution that protects you and your land. How did you get the land? And why is the constitution defending criminality? These are some of the questions or Andilem Ngitama and the PLF ask, correctly so, no, no velim pele. That they ask, what Joshua Mapo, is that they raise these things because they are, why is this constitution defending criminality? Why are you not saying, if we're going to speak state of emergency with COVID, state of emergency with ESCOM, why is there no state of emergency with land? Let us withhold the laws and the constitution and say, no, guys, black people don't have land. So we will 
hold the constitution to the side and say, give them back their land. No money will be paid and, and so that we can be fine. So we've got an issue with these laws that especially privileged white people want us to abide by, that have given them privileges that were earned through criminality and the exploitation of black labor and resources and land. And I ask them, if black people are to have a fighting chance, do you think it will ever happen without criminality? Because if we are going to agree that Jacob Zuma is corrupt, the Guptas were corrupt, Ubanban is corrupt, and they come one day and they say, yes, we committed crimes, but the only way for us to ever find dignity for our people is for us to steal back what was stolen from us. Because you speak mafias today. Oh, it's so wrong. Yes, it inconveniences good, very good middle class people, very good low rich people, very good poor people. It destroys our economy. It destroys our quality of life. There are people dying, dying because of their oxygen tanks. They can't afford generators. Someone was telling me the other day, I think 29 people die every month in this one private institution which cannot afford generators and the people there rely on oxygen. We don't know how many others. Some form of evil, evil. And you're like, but do these people not have hearts? And good white people will ask, do these people not have hearts? And a, a black person will ask them, why have you never asked that of your white predecessors that have led to this, des this desperate situation where black people are willing to commit evils to try and get back what your ancestors stole. And the reason you are defending them is because you do not want to lose your privilege. You refuse to share. You have solar panels and inverter. Are you willing to let good, poor black people move into your house and live with you? Or do you want them to be kept there? Because you claim, oh, let's all work together in the rainbow nation. Or are you gonna be like, no, no, not my privilege. Because that's the same argument that a lot of these rich, tenderpreneurs, black, white, whatever, they don't want to let go of their privilege. Who must let go of their privilege? And the same middle class that complains on Twitter, oh, this is messed up. Are you willing to vote differently? Are you willing to work for companies that are progressive in the things you stand for? Are you going to keep working for the same companies I've named, which pay you very nice salaries? There's no bank that will pay you better than a new black bank that's struggling. You know, or on Tabeleng Dikhoti with the WYBN Mutual Bank. They were going to pay pub salary. Are you willing to leave a big company like Investec and go and work there? Are you willing to leave a big company like a ShopRite to go and work for Usbuda's Puzzle Shop? Are you willing to stop working at wherever or to live in these comfortable neighborhoods? Your same black politicians live in spaces where they never get load shed. They send their kids to private schools. Uh, they use private health care and medical aid. They themselves, or Julius Malima, no Floyd Chibamba, and shout out to Floyd, who gave an amazing Sonnet debate on, on energy and electricity. Sonnet debate, you can go check that on, on YouTube as well. Floyd Chibamba, great intellectual, always has some of the greatest comebacks at Sona. But these guys live privileged lives. Are they willing to let go of their privilege? They tell white people to lose their privilege. Are they willing to lose their privilege? Are we willing to lose our privilege? To our pen, well, because you're privileged, but okay, then who must change? Because I tell you now, if I get into politics, if I get into big business, I will not last. Andre Tereita was almost killed, according to him. And he's leaving. He's like, I want to take care of my family. And he says he's even leaving South Africa to take a break. We'd like to think he's a good person. He was trying to do the right thing. We don't know. Oh, Matila Koko now are facing court cases, or Brian Mulife. Jacob Zuma, who some people believe was trying to win the economy back from black people, he's got cases, he was in jail. You realize that if I get into that space, if I have any chance of fighting against evil, I will have to take on an evil myself. But what happens when I take on that evil? How do you know that once I take it on, I will still be a good person? And I will not say, no, let me be wealthy alone. Let me be a dollar billionaire. Let me go to the World Economic Forum and say whatever needs to be said. To us, someone was killed and I'm shocked. Wow, that is so bad. People were killed in Marikana. Ah, that's tragic. But you're a billionaire. Ah, people died there. Taxi wars in Durban. Hey, some of them may have been your nephews that were involved because they own a lot of taxis. Hey, hey, that is so bad. I'm, I'm not involved. Praveen, what's happening here? You, 
Titombo way in what I am not involved. But you sit on Goldman Sachs, Trevor Manuel, what's happening? We see the Rothschilds, monetary. No, 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 no. We, we don't know what's happening. It's tragic. Look at what's happening with COVID. What do I know? We don't know the. Maybe if I, if I get in and I really want to make a change, I will become evil. And the type of evil that is maybe even worse. That's when people speak about a worse devil. Rather the devil you know. Rather the ANC, at least in the RTP, it's like fine. At least in Nukbamu 350. At least in Ganyamino Guja, Umto, Eskel. Mango Tello, John Stien is in It's not even 30 years. Ongamla can say whatever they want. 30 years is nothing for the atrocities of apartheid and colonization, for them to expect us to be fine. And I add these disclaimers when I make these videos that I'm a non-racialist and I work with white people because I'm privileged. And white people need to understand that. Penal brew, why don't you tell them? I can't tell them because I don't live in a shack. I'm not begging for a crown. You're expecting me to speak to those people the same way ANC, EFF leaders that live in nice neighborhoods must go speak to them, but I'm detached from their reality. What kind of moron would burn a library, would burn a clinic, and get the type of moron that's desperate? Because you guys in Europe were not desperate, but you decided to come to Africa and kill us and enslave us. What kind of moron would do that? What kind of moron is comfortable to live in privilege and not share with the rest of the country? Think about that before you go and judge people that are desperate. No person wants to burn their home. It is stupid and they know it, but it's like, for how long must we beg? And the only time the ANC shows up, the only time some of these white people start listening to us is when we start looting and rioting and burning. So yeah, I think I'll stop there for, for today. That was, that was my piece. Sure, 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 sure. I am burning with fire today. I couldn't say anything. Definitely cats cut my tongue. And I think there's a lot for us to think about. There's a lot of research for a lot of us to do. And a lot of the times when these conversations get brought up is like, what are the solutions? What are the solutions? What are the solutions? I think it's all up to us right now to go think about it. I think I mean, I was not even needed in this episode. And thank you for your truths, for your truths. Thank you for your conspiracy theories. I sent you, a message. That sorry, you sorry, to share it. today yeah. for us to think about, yeah. right or wrong. You know, and also just thank you for sure. I also kind of felt, let me just keep quiet and listen. Because I saw you, you, you wrote notes. Like, I think if the, that was on an A4, that probably would have been a two-pager today. Huh. And, and thank you for making us think. I think there's a, lot of, there's a lot to think about as far as this episode is concerned. I think a lot of us are going to have to rewind this episode and watch it again. And I do know that a lot of you guys are going to chop it up into a lot of clips that are going to be all over the internet. I think there's a lot of um, thought that we have to put into what has been said. Because what it does is it unravels or it uncovers a lot of dirt that is just behind the scenes that is just let go, Jay. Or a lot of it we're not even a lot of it we're not even aware about. And thank you for um for touching on it um unapologetically straight on confronting it and just speaking your truth mm. and look forward like, onto the camera. I think uh, I appreciate that. I don't have much to say on today's episode. I think this, this episode is going to be um, one of those that get to a lot of South Africans thinking. A lot of videos will be shared, but at the same time, what do we do? So look, I think I challenge to yourself. Uh, thank you for the platform, Yokpoja. And I think I challenge to yourself is because it's, Kukwini, it's our home, um, now, if you ever have anything, uh, like I, because before we came with Ngkele and Jukulmang Eskom, you know, there are so many other issues that are affecting people. There are so many things in the news that we're dealing with. But I just wanted today to come and tackle this. So, Nami Ngkele on your side, would now, if ever, please let us know so I can take a back seat as well. And you speak to myself, you speak to the squatters, you school us, you've got a lot of knowledge. You've got a lot of behind the scenes information in various spaces, spaces that people don't know. They know you from entertainment, they know you now from retail and more fine business, but there are so many other spaces people don't know. So this is a challenge and a plea, at least for me to you, Uti. On other days, now please, if Uzoa Umoya, Uvuga, please feel free. My challenge to the squatters, which, which, which I, I, I also said earlier is, there's a lot of us that claim to be educated, knowledgeable. Guys, it's on us to go and be the solutions that we need. 
Some of you work at ESCOM. Some of you work for some of the companies I mentioned. And not everyone is going to be a politician. Not everyone's going to be a celebrity. Or, but some of you are going to be our heroes in some of those spaces. And we need you guys to fight the good fight. And it must be led by your conscience and by the legacy we want to leave for our children. I'm, I'm not saying I don't understand. I know a lot of people get bribed in various... I know some of you out there are going to watch this knowing that you collect bribes. I'm just saying in the collecting of bribes, try and think of the long term because some of the destruction you are causing is going to end up biting you. And you realize you were part of the problem that led to that power being gone. Utoluguti, lautata konama bribes for ama potholes, no mutoli tendo kanum kwa ako, mesu tazama shortcut. Uzwek tiwa, uantu ako was in a car accident or he takes it kimwegile and she passed away because they hit a pothole. Kandi, you're part of that value chain of what led to that pothole because you didn't do a good job and now you've lost someone that you love. So let's just be a bit thoughtful in the work that we do. Let's try and find some of the solutions to my white Afrikaner friends and viewers. Guys, you guys led the way in uplifting yourselves after the British. And I'd like to think I've met enough Afrikaners to know how many Afrikaners are absolutely passionate about South Africa and love South Africa and see South Africa as their home. Because you can only be an Afrikaner in South Africa. You can't be an Afrikaner elsewhere. The whole race and culture of being an Afrikaner is born here. You guys speak about the fatherland. And we need some of you to rise and to not sell us out as a nation. You guys oppressed and exploited us and, and we're not happy and you still need to say sorry, but we need to come together and we need to work. And you guys need to help us where we fall short. You guys need to help us and say, guys, let's do things like this. And some of us are willing to hold hands and fix this country because this is the only country that we have. We don't want to leave and go somewhere else because this is our home. And don't let funny external people from outside come and infiltrate our home and destroy what you guys helped us to build and what we helped you with exploited labor, what we helped you build as well, which is this precious nation of South Africa. We need to hold hands and try and fight for our nation. I know I made a plea to Ian Kabi last week and, and some of the people understood and some of the people contacted me and they thanked me for that. I'm gonna make a plea to big business and big politicians that I know you guys chase money and profits, etc. cetera. I, I know it's tough. We've got shareholders and investors and some of you are also scared for your lives. I, I fully understand. You might be the CEO of a big company, never mind ESCOM, and you're scared of losing your family if you don't sign off a contract, if you don't turn a blind eye and look the other. I understand, trust, trust. Andre Tereta spoke about assassinations every week in Pumalang that the media doesn't even report on anymore. These are facts. Yeah, Baba. Guys, come on, man. Please help us fight for our country. Go check out the Gates and McKenzie three part on Facebook. Type in Gates and McKenzie SCOM. Or maybe I'll, I'll rewrite it on Penuel, the black pen on SCOM. I'll send it to DJ Spoo as well. Hopefully he'll post it on his page. Go and read the whole thing that Gates and McKenzie wrote on the problems at SCOM and then the po possible solutions. Because I know when you read that thing, you'll realize at some point some of that affects you. How you vote, how you spend money, how you work, how you speak, and end. Thank you, Love you, bro. Thank Hope you guys will have a great week, man. Have a great week, too. The virtual yeah. cook, I think we're out. VM. Uh, uh, uh.